And so with last week's video on the Infinity Gauntlet and Infinity Stones being well received, I figured I'd test the waters a second time by focusing on the first 10 Iron Man armors in Marvel Comics. And this is really just designed to see whether or not people are interested in seeing something like this. But something I'd also like to point out here is that like our video on the Infinity Gauntlet, we're only going to be focusing on the versions of these armors from the main Marvel Universe. So in my video on Iron Man Explained, we had run over the first armor which was presented as a kind of bare bones suit using a combination of basic parts and on hand metals. In truth, there's really not much to offer here in the way of discussion except to say that it was really only designed as a temporary suit with Tony intending to create something more advanced later on. Now this more advanced suit came in the form of the Mark II armor with Tales of Suspense issue number 48. Now I'm actually going to give this armor a little more attention than the others and the reason why is because the advent of the Mark II actually set the stage for the rest of his armor models going throughout Iron Man's publications in Marvel Comics. With that in mind, this armor actually came out of Marvel moving forward with the Iron Man series after considering it to be a success. Within the comics, however, this armor came out of Tony Stark doing battle with a villain named Nathan Dolly who at the time of this story was able to create voodoo dolls of victims and force them to act in accordance with his own wishes. With the first conflict between the two seeing Iron Man's defeat, this also came with Stark's realization that the Mark I armor was simply too large and cumbersome, being equivalent to a broadsword rather than a scalpel. Going back to the drawing board, Stark designed a new set of armor composed of a metal alloy that was thinner and more flexible than the Mark I armor, but also just as strong. With the Mark I drawing massive amounts of power from the miniature battery in Stark's chest, the new armor was designed to draw less power and more efficiently utilize the power that it did draw. As it was described as, the main chest piece contained a brunt of the armor's durability due to Stark's need to ensure that the battery in his heart wasn't damaged. However, redundancies were put in place with the wristbands containing backup batteries should the main battery fail, allowing Stark to remain alive and operable. Running along the arms and legs was a yellow metal alloy that was more akin to fabric in terms of its appearance and function, but was highly durable and connected the wrist to the shoulders using magnets. Something to also take note of is that the Mark II did not have repulsor rays in the hands and instead relied on the enhanced strength and durability provided by the suit as well as magnetic and electric repulsors in addition to jets on the feet. Finally, the last upgrade offered by the Mark II armor over the Mark I was the helmet. While the Mark I was a giant head of sorts that was soldered onto the body and limited Stark's field of view, the Mark II helmet operated more akin to a human head, allowing for turning and better fields of vision, as well as an adjustable faceplate. Having said that, the repulsor rays of Iron Man made their debut in 1965 with Tales of Suspense issue number 66 and the introduction of the Mark III. On its surface, with the exception of a nose being built into the face mask as well as the repulsor rays, the physical difference between the Mark II and the Mark III weren't that big. However, the true difference between the two came with regards to the upgrades to the suit's offensive and defensive capabilities. While the Mark I and Mark II provided for magnetic and electric repulsors in the hands as well as jets in the feet and enhanced strength, the Mark II also offered varying sensors to detect movement and life signs, a hidden blade, first aid, an EMP, and the ability to withstand atomic explosions at close range. The Mark III armor improved on all these elements of the Mark II by upgrading the electric and magnetic repulsors to repulsor rays capable of emitting particle energies weak enough to push an opponent away, to being strong enough to burn holes through all metals with the exception of adamantium and vibranium. The Mark III armor was also able to emit holograms and heat, absorb extreme temperatures, and contain smoke bombs, bomb pellets, a chemical kit, a cutting blade, a sound duplicator, and a high frequency wave generator to deafen opponents. Now moving on to the Mark IV, this armor debuted in Iron Man issue number 65 in 1976. Coming out of the destruction of the Mark III armor during a story which saw Happy Hogan becoming a villain named Freak, the Mark IV was designed to improve on the Mark III by removing obsolete features and upgrading existing ones. To this end, the Mark IV used 3D knitting technology, meaning that while the yellow sleeves and legs were still fabric in appearance and composed of a metal alloy, a force field was utilized to give the appearance that the arms and legs were solid metal. Furthermore, rather than simply absorbing extreme temperatures and dispersing them, the Mark IV was able to absorb any form of energy that wasn't psionic in nature, store it, and use it to power the armor. Where well, the Mark IV also used a unibeam which is identical to the repulsor rays but discharged from the chest, it also had the ability to evade detection, emit multiple holograms rather than just one, distort Stark's voice to keep his identity hidden, burrow underground, control the Marks I, II, and III, and adjust the visual spectrum of the armor to infrared, and constantly monitor the life signs of various members of the Avengers and Stark's closest friends, regardless of their locations or distance from him. 
What I'd also like to mention is that one of this armor's biggest benefits came with the fact that in Iron Man issue number 19 in 1969, Stark underwent heart transplant surgery which removed the issue of the shrapnel potentially killing him. What this meant was that the Mark IV and all future models could be designed for maximum efficiency without having to worry about special attention being paid to Stark's heart. Now moving to the Mark V, this version debuted in Iron Man issue number 142 and is the first armor of Stark to be used for exotic purposes like traveling into space. While this doesn't mean that the previous versions were incapable of space travel, the Mark V was designed explicitly for this purpose, meaning it could stay in space longer. As a result, the armor only appears about 15 times in Marvel Comics and aside from an improved life support system, control system, auto camera, and sonar, there isn't much difference between this and the Mark IV. Jumping to the Mark VI, like the Mark V, this version was designed to function in a limited capacity and that it was designed for use underwater. However, the armor contained a few abilities that were exotic, including the ability to eject ink similar to an octopus, emit an electric pulse similar to an eel, and contain turbines in the boots rather than energy-based jets. In addition to this, because it was designed to allow Stark to visit Namor in his home city of Atlantis, the armor was reinforced and capable of withstanding the pressure of the ocean at extremely low depths. Continuing on with these exotic armors, the Mark VII was designed to function with stealth taking precedence above all else. To this end, the armor was black in nature rather than the signature red and yellow. In terms of its abilities, this armor was capable of absorbing sonar waves making it invisible to radar, containing dampening units on the boots to minimize the noise and emissions of the jets, and can camouflage to its environment but only using singular colors rather than a multitude of different forms and shapes. Now the Mark VIII returns us to the varying standards of Iron Man's armors and where it was originally introduced in Iron Man issue number 200 in 1985, the Mark VIII gained its fame during the six-part story Armor Wars, taking place between Iron Man issues 225 and 231. When it initially appeared, because it was designed to be used by James Rhodes, the Mark VIII was for all intents and purposes identical to the Mark IV. However, with Armor Wars seeing Stark's Iron Man technology stolen and sold to varying criminals, the Mark VIII was upgraded with vast enhancements designed to combat the various criminals who had created their own versions of the Iron Man armor. To this end, at the height of its abilities, the Mark VIII had improved flight and maneuverability with the booster pack on its back to allow for faster flight. The repulsor rays and the unibeam were much stronger, capable of inflicting incredible damage on virtually all metals, except for adamantium and vibranium. Melee weapons like heat lances, cutting lasers, shock sticks, and tractor beams were added for close range battles, and a disruptor was added, allowing for the armor to jam electrical signals. Now transitioning to the Mark IX, this model began the line of Stark's signature design in terms of its physical appearance and was a massive step up in terms of power and capabilities. Because the Armor Wars revealed the fact that the world had the ability to duplicate Stark's technology as the plans were now out in the open, much like all new, all different Invincible Iron Man, Stark went back to the drawing board regarding the design of his suits. While the Mark IX had been an experiment prior to Armor Wars, rather than keeping it locked away, Stark revisited the suit and added a number of upgrades. First and foremost, where all the previous models used batteries or relied on stored energy for power, the Mark IX used beta particles. Now to be honest, I can't think of a way to describe beta particles without going into a long-winded explanation about ionizing radiation and electrons. So to keep it simple, the armor basically uses solar energy from the sun in a more efficient way, meaning that it was faster and capable of stronger repulsor rays than its previous models. In addition to this, as a byproduct of the armor wars and in order to ensure that the future forms of his armor could not be copied, Stark installed an electronic chip which would automatically shut the armor down if anyone used it without authorization, keeping it from being tampered with or duplicated. Building on the technologies of the previous Mark armors, the Mark IX was also able to tap into electrical interfaces, track up to 60 targets at once regardless of their size, location, or distance, translate all known languages in the Marvel Universe, automatically engage safety protocols that kept Stark from going blind and deaf while in battle, emit various gases ranging from incapacitating agents to deadly toxins, as well as physical modifications allowing the armor to travel into the depths of space and down to the deepest parts of the ocean. Now as the last armor in this video, the Mark X came as a byproduct of an event called Operation Galactic Storm and was the first armor designed explicitly to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with advanced alien technology. As a 19-part series written in 1992, Operation Galactic Storm saw most of Earth's major heroes including the Avengers, Avengers West Coast, Hank Pym, Thor, Quasar, Captain America, and Iron Man coming together in an effort to end the war between the Shi'ar and the Kree. Now if you're interested in learning about these races, I have videos on them, but the overall theme was that the Kree's spiritual leader called the Supreme Intelligence had launched a war against the Shi'ar in their hopes 
that they would be able to use a weapon called the Nega Bomb, which would annihilate 99% of the Kree population, forcing its race to evolve. With the intention proving to be true, because Tony Stark was going headlong into the conflict rather than staving off occasional invasions, the Iron Man armor needed to be modified to cope with the advanced technologies of both the Kree and the Shi'ar. To this end, because a Mark IX was so advanced, there weren't a lot of changes to be made here. The first upgrade came in the form of a cloaking device that could hide the armor from the radars of both the Kree and the Shi'ar, as well as an advanced onboard computer that could calculate virtually any scenario and its outcome. In addition to this, the life support systems were modified to keep a detailed analysis of Stark's vital systems. The helmet was designed to protect from psionic attacks from powerful individuals like the Supreme Intelligence and Oracle, a member of the Shi'ar Imperial Guard capable of telepathy. And finally, the armor was fitted with a self-destruct mechanism capable of obliterating virtually any vessel in the universe. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end, and let me know how you guys think the armor in the comics compares to the armors in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm kind of curious what you all think about that, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.